So in this video, um, I'm going to talk about Cauchy Euler equations. Um, so basically, a Cauchy Euler equation is a linear differential equation of this form. Okay? So we have, you have your coefficients here, a sub n, a sub n minus 1, a sub 1, and uh, a sub 0. And then you have your corresponding differentials. Okay? So the thing here to notice, right, what makes this a Cauchy order equation is that the order, right, the order of your differentials matches the degree of your of these monomials. Okay? So for example, here, right, you have this is the nth order, nth differential order, and here's n, and then it works basically. Um, that's that's how it works. Okay, and that's what's that's what makes this a Cauchy order equation. So in the previous videos, uh, we were mostly focusing on differential equations that were linear where the, where the coefficients were constant, right? right. Um, so here, so we have a new, so we have a new structure involved. And so therefore um, it's gonna require a little bit, uh, it's gonna require a different technique to solve these, okay? All right, so what we can do here is first, um, in developing our technique to solve this, we can focus on the homogeneous part, meaning that we want to let g of x be equal to zero, okay? And then um, if g of x is not equal to zero, then you can use one of your, um, you can use um, previous technique, okay? Meaning one of the previous techniques, um, for example, uh, the variation of parameters that we uh, that we discussed um, in the previous video lecture. All right, so let's get started here. Um, so we're going to focus on again. We're going to focus on the homogeneous linear differential equation, um, and particularly when n is two. Okay? And then just like we did, um, just like we did before where the coefficients were constant, uh, we're gonna look at the different cases and then we can extend on those ideas okay, for, higher, uh, for higher order differential equations. All right. Okay, so let's see. So again, what we wanna do here Right, we, we want to assume, right? We want to assume a general form of a solution for this. Okay. So for right for this case, we're gonna assume that y is equal to x of m. Okay, we're gonna assume that as a solution of of our equation, okay, of equation one. Or g of x equal to zero. Okay, so just like we've done in the past, we're gonna take this solution, we're gonna plug it into our second order, okay? So let's go ahead and write down our second order here. So, so that is, so one being this equation here. So I have A's, AX squared by double prime, plus bx times dy dx plus c times y equal to zero. So this is my, this is the equation that we're focusing on, okay? So equation one. All right, so 
So let's go ahead and do, uh, let's go ahead and take the uh, first derivative of this and the second derivative. So we have y equals to x to the power m. Okay, y prime is simply going to be m times x to the m minus one. Okay, again, where m, right, m is just a constant here. And then y double prime, we're going to have m times m minus one times x to the power m minus two. Okay, very similar to what we did before uh, uh, when we first looked at homogeneous differential equations with constant coefficients, okay? So now we're gonna substitute, basically again, we're gonna substitute those into here, okay? All right, so let's do that. We're gonna get, A times x squared times m times m minus one times x to the power m minus two plus a b times m times x to the m minus one plus c times x to the m equals to zero. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's see here. We can go ahead and simplify this. Okay. So this is just ax squared times m times m minus one. This we can we can break up this part. This is just x to the m times x to the minus two plus b times m x to the m times x to the minus one plus c times x to the m equals zero. Okay, so we can see that x, the x squared and, and one over x squared, those are gonna cancel out. And the same thing here, okay, we have, um, let's see, x, x m and x minus one. So that should be, oh, no, bx, oh, there should be a bx here. Okay, yeah. So we have b, right, types x. So therefore, yeah, x and one over x, obviously those are gonna cancel out. So this is going to leave us with basically a times m times m minus one times x to the m plus b times m times x to the m plus c times x to the m equals to zero. Okay. And then from there, we notice that you have, right, we have x to the m in each term. So we can go ahead and um, safely cancel those out. All right, so that's going to leave us with okay, so basically we have a x to the m. Okay, I'll just go ahead and factor those out. All right, so x to the m, it, that's basically going to give us, right, when we set this equal to zero. Um, we get x equals zero. So that's a trivial solution. So we're not interested in those. Okay. So that's going to leave us with this equation here. So we're going to get am squared plus, it's going to be minus a times m plus b times m plus c equals to zero. And this is equivalent to this a times m squared plus m times b minus a plus c. Okay, so this is our corresponding auxiliary equation, or sometimes it's known as the characters equation for the cauchy euler equation, okay? So as we expect, it should be, you know, it's a little bit different from the, from the previous one.
Okay. So there's our characteristic equation. So based on based on the um, based on the discriminant of this, right? It's that's going to give us um, the. It's going to basically give us the uh, the type of solutions that we that we're working with. Okay. All right. So let's dive into this. So first case, right? Case one is that we have distinct real roots, okay? So let M, M1, M, M2, be real roots. Such that M1 is not equal to M2, right? Because they're distinct. Okay. okay. So basically, this is going to give us our fundamental, uh, our fundamental set of solutions. So Y1 is going to be equal to X to the power M1. And y2 is going to be equal to x to the power m2. And then so those form the, so basically those are basic solutions. Um, it can be easily shown that these are linearly independent. And therefore, we can get, take the linear combination of those, which therefore gives us our fundamental, um, our fundamental solution set, or our general solution. So there's our right. There's our solution, our general solution. Okay. And remember, these are just these are just the basis of our solution set. Okay. So if you've taken you've taken linear algebra. Um, then you kind of you, you basically uh, same idea here, okay? Except that we're working with functions, okay? So the idea is that because these are literally independent and they span the solution set that they're in, okay? So therefore, um, this forms. Therefore, if you take the link, therefore the general solution is just a linear combination of this. All right. So, and we can generalize this. This can be generalized for higher order different. So for each root, okay? So for each distinct root, you would just have, it would basically have its own term, okay? So if you have three distinct roots, okay? It would be C1 times X to the M1 plus C2 times X to the M2 plus another constant, let's say C3 times X to the power M3, okay? So for each distinct root, it has its own term, okay? Very similar to the, um, the differential equations, particularly the homogeneous differential equations with constant coefficients, okay? So let's look at what happens for, okay, um, for um, repeated roots, okay? But first I wanna do, so I wanna go to an example of this, okay? And then we'll look at the second case. All right, let's do, let's do that example here. Okay. So 
let's say we want to solve x squared times y double prime okay so notice this is a Cauchy order equation right because we have first order differential right this is power one this is the second order we have right, the second degree here this monomial okay so therefore, right, you, so technically we could, you know, you could go through this entire derivation again, right? You could say, okay, you can stick, you know, substitute these in, you know, stick those into there and then figure out what the specific m value is. But however, why do that? Uh, when we already, you know, we can just work with what we've just derived, right? So I just have to keep in mind what, you know, just have to keep in mind that um, for this middle term, you have b minus a. So a being one, right? Uh, b being minus two, okay? and c being negative four. Okay. There's a, there's b, and there's c. Okay, so. All right, so we're going to have m squared plus m times b, b is minus two, and a is one. So plus, in this case, c is negative four, so we have minus four. So this is going to simplify to give us m squared minus 3m minus four. Okay. There's our characters equation, okay? okay? So now we can use either the quadratic formula or we can factor here, okay? I'll go ahead and factor in this case. Um, so this is just M minus one times M plus, let's see, sorry, M plus one, right? And M minus four, since we have minus three there, right? So, so this combination will work. So therefore, our solutions, right? our solution is m equals negative one and m equals to four. Okay, so then we, right, we just basically substitute those into there to get our general solution. So therefore, y is going to be equal to c1e to the minus x plus c2e to the four x. So there's our, there's our solution. Right. So again, we just formulate our characters equation based on what we have here. Solve that using you know, either the quadratic formula or factoring, okay, and then substitute those uh, values into, into the equation that we have, okay, into this equation that we derived. Okay. So if there are some boundary conditions involved, right, or some initial values, then um, you're going to need, right, because we have because this solution. Right, the solution is uh, based on two, right? Two solutions, two right? fundamental uh, solutions. So you need at least, right? We need, right? We need uh, two initial values. Okay. So if you have a problem like that, then you would just say, okay, if they give you initial condition, then you would just plug it in here. Okay. Um, you would get an equation. Most likely, you would get an equation with, right, with C one and C two involved. And then for the other initial condition, where they give you the, basically they give you the um, information about the slope of the tangent line at that point, okay? And then you would take the derivative of this, right? Plug that second initial value in, and then you would have your, basically you would have a system of equations, right? So two equations to a note, and that would give you C1 and C2. Okay, so let's look at what happens if um, if we have repeated roots. Okay. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to move this over here.
Okay, so if, if we have repeated roots, um, just like we saw with the const with the linear homo with the linear homo differ differential equations, um, we need to uh, we know right we know we know one of the solutions right. Um, so we need to figure out what the second we need to figure out a second solution. That's not the same as the first, but at the same time, we need to the requirement is that those two solutions have to be linearly independent of each other. Okay, so let's go do that. Okay, repeated real roots. Okay, so again, you know, we have our we have our characters equation here, and let's suppose that we you know we solve it and we get basically a, a root that has multiplicity of two. Okay, so that would mean okay, this would imply that m1 is equal to m2. So sometimes we call this a double root. Okay. Uh, and so then this implies that y would be equal to x to the power m1. Okay. All right. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to we need um, we need to figure out specifically what m one is, okay? and so then we can go back to our characters equation okay, back to here, okay? and then let's calculate the discriminant for that. Again, we know that. We, we're working with the case right, where we have a double root, okay, um, and then we can figure out what we can figure out what m one is. Okay. So we're gonna have minus b over a, right? That's that's your right. That's the term next to m, right? That's your b term, right? Okay. Plus or minus square root. Uh, B minus A squared minus four A times C divided by two A. So again, the discriminant will be zero here because that's how you get roots of multi of, of multiplicity. Okay? So this part right here, it's all going to be zero. Okay, so that's going to leave us basically with m1 equals to minus b minus a over 2a. Okay. okay. All right, so, so how can we, right? So we know M1, right, based on what A and B are. So the question is, how can we get the second solution? Well, just like we did before, we're gonna go back and use the reduction of order method, okay? All right, we're gonna use that form, we're gonna apply that formula, and therefore that should be able to, uh, we, we will be able to um, obtain our second solution. All right, so to do that, remember, we have to be working in a standard form, okay? So going back, let's see, to this form.
Remember, this is the form that we're working with. So in order to apply, in order to apply the, um, the reduction of order method, we have to be working in a standard form. All right, so let's go ahead and put this in standard form. So we divide everything by AX squared. Okay, so again, just dividing through by AX squared here, okay, and then simplifying. So there's our, there's our P of X value. Okay, so let's go ahead and apply the reduction of order. Let's write the formula here just to recall. Okay. Remember the, for the reduction of order. Then we had y2 equals to y1 times the integral of e to the minus or, yeah, minus the or negative integral of this, okay, p of x, dx um, divided by y1 squared. Okay, so again, this is just the reduction of order form formula. Okay, let's apply that. We have, right, we, we're going to apply this where we know that uh, y1 is equal to x to this. But this is M1. Okay. All right, so let's plug everything in. For, for a moment, I'm gonna leave that, I'm gonna leave that as M1. Okay, we can go ahead and we can just take care of that part later. And then we have E. So P of X, right? uh, P of X being D over AX, so we have E to the minus integral of P over A X. Okay. Make sure y'all can see that there. Yeah, it's a little hard to read. Let me put this down a little bit. And then so I'll divide by y one. All right. So all right, let's take care of the let's do the integral part on the side here. So we have the integral of P over AX DX. So P, um, or sorry, not, not P, B. Okay, so that's P, not, not P, sorry. 
Okay, so the integral, the integral of that, right, where b and a are constant, this is just going to be b over a times the integral of one over x with respect to x. Okay, so that's just going to be b over a times natural log x. Okay, so plugging all that back into here, okay, uh, y2, remember y1 was just x to the power m1. And again, we'll take, we'll simplify that part later. So this is just e to the minus v over a times natural log x divided by y1. Okay. All right, so again, just to make sure, right? Just make sure you're clear what we're doing here. Okay, we're, we're in case two, right? Uh, we want to, our desire is to find a second solution that is linearly independent with this one. Okay. And so we use the reduction of order formula to do that. Right? So y1 is here, okay? And, and then we substitute everything back in, okay? So, and p of x is here. We know p of x, we know y1, right? And then this should be squared. Okay. All right. So just a direct application of this formula. That's all that is. Okay. Now the rest of it is just simplifying and getting it down to a point where we can utilize it. Okay. All right. So y2, we have y2 is equal to, uh, this is just x to the power m1. Okay. Now b over a. Okay. Um, let me have all right. So, so from here, b over so this can be expressed as a power, and therefore, right. So we can write this way. Just using a little bit of algebra here. E to the this is the same as e this part. This is just e to the natural log of x to the power of minus b over a. And so therefore, that's just going to give us, uh, basically, that's just x to the power of minus b over a. Okay. All right. So that's, that helps quite a bit in terms of our, in terms of simplifying this. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, so x1, remember y1, okay, uh, y1 is x to the m1. So when you substitute here, this is just going to become x to the power m1, m2, or 2 times m1, because you're squaring it here. Okay. All right, so then. This is okay. Um, this is just equal to x to the m1. Let's be able to do that over there. And this is this is just x. They have the same base here, so we can consolidate this. This is going to be uh, minus yeah, minus b over a minus two m1. Again, just some algebra there. Okay. All right. And so then now let's go ahead and substitute in what M1 is. M1 is this. Okay. All right. So this is going to give us y2 equals to x to the, again, I'll just keep this as M1. And we have the integral of x to the minus b over a minus two times M1, so, all right? So what happens is that obviously here, the twos will cancel out and that's gonna leave us with, and we have a negative there, okay? So that's gonna leave us with B minus A over A. Okay. okay, so in fact, I'll just go ahead and write out that detail.
Okay. So this is equal to y2 is equal to x to the m1. Okay. This is going to be uh, the twos cancel out. So we're left with minus b over a. Okay. And then we have um, plus. Okay. Um, so we have b over a over over uh, over a. So again, um, this will become positive here, right? And then the twos cancel out. And so that leaves us with B minus A over, over A. Okay. And then this is just minus B over A plus B over plus B over A minus um, A over A, okay, which is just going to give us one. Okay. All right. So let's see here. All right, let me just double check here. Yep, so we get x, yep, so we get x to the minus one. Okay, again, just simplify this part. This part is just minus b over a and plus b over a and then we have minus a over a so therefore this is going to give us minus one for the exponent oh very nice okay so we, um so then from there okay this is going to be x to the basically we have x to the m1 times the integral of one over x, and that's just natural log x. And I'll go ahead and just put the opposite value here. Um, although it's really not necessary because in, in this course, we're working ma mainly with uh, real values, right? Um, and a lot of and the dom so the domains that we're working with are real. So, um, otherwise, if you know, if, you know if, you, if you're working with complex numbers, then you get what's called branch cuts. Okay. All right. So anyway, so we can just go ahead and we're just going to leave it as one. All right. So, okay. so I just go ahead and keep that absolute value. All right. There's our, so the bottom line is there's our second solution, okay? Mm -hmm. So just similar, so very similar to what we saw before when we had the linear differential equations with um, constant coefficients. We had to multiply the second solution by X. Here, it turns out to keep everything linearly independent, we multiply by natural. Okay, let's okay, let's um, let me just kind of write a summary of what we have here so far. So for case one, you have distinct real roots.
back where that would be. You have M1 and M2 be distinct groups. And they're, and, and they're real. Okay. Real distinct groups, right? And so therefore the solution that we, that we have, okay, the solution is going to be Y equals to C1 times X to the power M1 plus C2 times X to the power M2. Right, so these two, this is when we have uh, roots of real, we have basically uh, distinct roots, sorry, not distinct roots, roots of multiplicity. Or in other words, repeated roots. Okay. Um, so by the way, just before I go into that one, um, remember that this can be generalized. Okay. So if you have M1, M2, M3, dot, 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 and so on. Okay, so if you have N distinct roots, then your general solution will be C1x to the power M1 plus C2 times X to the M2 plus C3 X to the power M3 and so on. So again, each right, each distinct root right, corresponds to a term. Right? So case two. Case two, where we have repeated roots. So we have M1, a real root with multiplicity of two. Okay. So the result was that we got, right? We have that. Y is equal to C1 times X to the M1 plus C2 times X to the M1 times natural log X. Okay, again, so these, right, each of these is a solution, okay? Um, and then when you put them together, you get what's called a general solution, okay? So, this, so basically this forms the solution, the solu what's called the solution, uh, the solution span. Okay. And so for the generalized form, okay. okay, if you have, if let's say M1, So if M1 is a root of multiplicity K, okay, then your um, solution set will look like this. You would have um, basically Y equals to C1 times X to the M1 plus C2 x to the m1 times natural log x okay, plus c3 x to the m1 times a natural log another natural log x and then squared and then it would continue So 
this will be CK minus one. Okay, uh, yeah, so the reason it stops at k minus one is because uh, the first term doesn't have a natural log x in it, okay? And actually this would be, this would be k then. Okay, so the bottom line is that you just keep, right, you keep multiplying, all, you keep multiplying by a natural log x. So the number of terms here, it's always going to be, uh, well, if it's, if it's a multiplicity of K, then it's just gonna be, um, the number of terms will be K plus one. Okay. But, um, sorry, if it was, sorry, if you have multiplicity of K, then it would just be, um, you would just have uh, K terms. Right? Okay. So for example, um, right? For multiplicity, multiplicity of two, then right, we have two terms. If we have multiplicity of three, right, then it would be three terms. Okay. All right. So let's look at a let's look at a specific example of this. All right, so let's say we want to solve. Let's see this differential equation. All right, so we have 4x squared times y double prime plus 8x times y prime okay, plus y. So again, you could, you know, you could go ahead and do um, take y equals x to the m and take the successive derivatives, plug it in there, and then come out with a solution. Here. But why do that? Okay, we already have, you know, we already have a, uh, we already have the general solution here that we can utilize. Okay. Um, all right. So let's see. So let's formulate our characteristic equation. Again, that is going back to this one. Okay, we know that A is four. Okay. B is going to be eight, and C is just going to be one. So plugging those in, okay, we're going to have four times m squared plus eight minus four times m plus one. All right. And then simplifying that, uh, we're going to have 4m squared plus 4m plus 1. Equals to 0. All right. So this can easily be factored in the following form. So this is just 2m plus 1 squared equals to 0. Okay. 
And then, so therefore this tells us that M1 is going to be, or M1 has to be um, uh, a minus, um, has to be minus one half, right? With multiplicity of two. Okay, so our solution is going to be this, right? It's gonna be y equals to C1 E, sorry, C1 times X minus X to the power uh, to the power of minus one half plus C2 X to the power of minus one half times natural log X. Okay, so that is our, that is the solution. By the way, so again, so going back um, to what I mentioned earlier, uh, if we have, you know, going back to this case, if you have, um, let's see. Yeah, so let's assume that you're working with a third degree or higher, okay? Um, you would need to, or let's say you're given a, a third degree or higher differential equation, then you would need to substitute in X to the M. You would need to go through that process again. For that specific um, for that specific differential equation, okay, and then you would end up with your characters equation, okay? Because obviously, um, for this case, right? Okay, for that, you know, if you're given a degree two differential equation, okay, or order two differential equation, then you can use the so basically you can use this equation, okay. Or anything higher order, you can't use that. So you actually have to go through and re go through and rederive um, your characteristic equation again. Okay. Okay. So, so let's look at uh, let's look at complex conjugate roots. So that's the third case. If you're discriminant for this, um, it's going to be if it's imaginary. Okay. Okay. So case three. Okay, so this is when, uh, obviously, when we get the, uh, our discriminant will be less than zero. All right, so, uh, so, so based on that, right, okay, based on that fact, um, we're going to have, right, M1 is going to be, let's say, in this form, and M2 will be the complex conjugate. Okay, where alpha and beta are real values. And beta here can't be zero. If beta was zero, then that basically puts us back to the first case. Okay, so um, we can technically we can you know we could use I mean substitute these back into here, but then again, um, you know if we're trying to like you know if we're trying to let's say graph the solution, um, then how is that going to be possible, right? Unless you're working with unless you're working with um, a complex plane, which is actually which is basically a four dimensional subspace. Um, so 
that's a little bit hard. That's kind of nearly impossible to see. So um, our desire is to have our solution in terms of real values, okay? So very similar, right? Very, the, the idea, the approach here will be very similar to, again, what we saw with the, um, with the homogeneous linear differential equations with constant coefficients, okay? So we're going to make the use right, of, um, of, the, of the Euler's identity. Okay? So let's just go ahead and plug these in. Okay? So we have white, plug them into there. Okay? Oops. Okay, so we have C1 times X to the alpha plus I beta. Plus C2 times X to the alpha minus I beta. So again, our desire is to, we want to make this into a real value function. So we need to get rid of the, uh, we need to somehow get rid of the imaginary components here. All right, so um, we need to utilize the following identity. So if you recall from your pre-calculus class, right, um, you can take this expression and x and rewrite it as e to the natural log x, right? Because e and the natural log functions are inverse functions of each other. And so then this is just going to be right, um, e to the i beta times natural log x. I'll just put my, just putting the I in front there, okay? So the idea here is that we can, uh, we can break this up, right? We can say X to the alpha times X to the I beta, same thing here. And then you can, and then we can use this along with the orders of formula. Okay? So Euler's formula, right? We have x to the i beta, okay? Um, okay. So again, instead of theta, right? We we just replace theta with x. So the formula is still it's still the same idea. Um, so you're going to have cosine beta natural log x. Right? So, and then plus I times sine beta natural log x. Right, so again, just applying, we know this is equal to this and then apply where there's formula, right? right. So, okay. where this is your, well, this is, this is part of your, argument, okay? okay? All right, so, um, by the way, this is just, if you think about it, right, this is just a complex unit circle. That's all that is, okay? So I talk a little bit about that in my pre-calculus class. All right, um, anyway, so let's continue on here, okay? Uh, we can do the same thing or x to the minus i beta. Okay, so obviously that's gonna be um, you know, minus i there. So the reason, the reason that's minus there is because if you have i plus i sine, so this is right negative here. So, you're gonna have minus b times natural log x. So 
So we know that sine is an odd function. Okay? In fact, um, we also have it here. Okay, but the thing is, remember, so sine is odd, right? Cosine is even. So this is the same thing as cosine of beta natural log x, right? So the negative, so the, this and this are the same, because cosine is even. Um, sine is odd, so we can take out the, we can put this negative in, in the front. And that's a very useful. Um, that's a very useful property in terms of you know in terms of the even or odd properties. Um, it's because some because we never you know ideally we never want to leave these as negative arguments. Okay, we always want to make sure that we can um, simplify this. Okay, it makes it makes um, a lot of it makes things a lot easier to deal with. Okay, especially at the more complicated level. Right. So I always. I always stress this in my trick class that you, you should, you know, you should not leave these negatives here. Okay. All right. So now we have enough ingredients. All right. Um, we have x to the minus i beta here. And we have x to the i beta. So we can just go ahead and plug those in and then um, and then continue from there. So let's do it this way. Um, uh, let's go ahead and write this part. So just like last time, okay, just like um, just like when we looked at the linear differential equations with constant coefficients, um, right? Um, you we can go ahead and um, we can go ahead and add these, right? Okay. And so what's going to happen when we add? Right? So if we take add these together. So if we add those together, uh, then it's going to eliminate the sine term. Okay, so we end up getting two cosine of beta natural log x. Okay. Likewise, if we take the difference, so taking this minus this, then that's going to eliminate the cosine term. So we're going to get plus 2i times sine of beta natural log x. All right. All right, so what we're gonna do is we get the same, same thing that we saw before. We're gonna let C1 and C2 be equal to one. And then, so from here, that's going to give us um, y. So um, we're going to say that's y1. That's going to be x times alpha plus i beta plus x times alpha minus i beta. And then we can break this up. Break that up, and then we can go ahead and factor out x to the alpha. And there we go. We have x plus right. We have this one. We have this right. Um, so we can replace that with this. Okay. So this part is going to get replaced with this. Okay, let's see here. So we have y one. So x to the alpha times two. Okay. I'll just put the two in front, two times x alpha. I'm just plugging that into there. And then we have cosine of beta not to log x. Okay. 
Okay. So there's y1. Okay. So let's uh, let's get uh, y2 here. Okay. So for y, so to obtain y2, uh, we can let um, c1 be one and c2 be negative. Okay. So that's going to, again, that's right, plug it leads into here. That's, and we have y equals to c1, which is just one, x times, or x to the alpha plus i beta. And let's see, I put, so, I'm oh, sorry. So c1 is one, c2 is negative one. So if this minus x, to the power alpha minus i beta. But again, we can, just like we did up here, we can break these apart. Go ahead and factor out x to the alpha. And we can go ahead and substitute this into there. So that's going to give us y equals to x to the alpha times, you know, I'll go ahead and put 2y in front here. 2 times i times x to the alpha. Okay, times sine of beta natural log x. All right, so there's our two forms here. Okay. Yeah, this form. This one. So let's call this Y2. Okay, look at that. So um, it turns out it, it can be shown that if um, it can be shown that these are literally independent of each other. Okay. Okay, so, um, all right, so therefore, right, uh, we can take the, uh, we take the linear combination of those two, okay, all right, so we just need, remember, we just need the general solution, okay, all right, and so we can, um, basically, um, this is just a constant, right? Two is a constant. Two i is a constant. So we don't need to. We don't need that part. We we just need the we just need the bare bones solution, right? Okay, the, just the the basic for the basis, right, of this. All right. So let's see. Where can I do this? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and erase all this. But again, just to just to kind of summarize here. Okay, we have we started out with these complex conjugate roots. Okay, um, and then we plug them into there, and then the goal, right, the goal is to um, rewrite our general solution in terms of real value functions, okay? So we, so this, right, we just use this identity along with Euler's formula, okay, right? Because we know that this is equal to this, where right, we have e to the i theta is acting as b times natural log x, and then, um, right, so then applying this to, um, to these terms, okay, we end up getting these, okay, and then um, we take the um, we take the sum and difference of these, and then therefore we can apply that to um, to these to this equation, okay. And this is the resulting, right? So this is the results that we get here. Okay. All right.
Let's erase this. Okay, so our general solution, S y equals to, um, we have okay, x to the alpha again. So okay, this is just a constant, right? This is a constant. So we don't need to, uh, we, we don't, that's going to get absorbed into our, right, into our constant, okay, into our general constant. So we have y equals c1 times uh, x to the alpha. Times cosine of beta modulo x plus c2 times x to the alpha times sine of b modulo x. Remember that alpha, right? Um, alpha and beta are coming from the um, complex solution. Okay, and then we can, if you want, we can factor out x to the alpha. All right, there it is. There's right. There's the um, there's the form that we need. Okay. So again, if you have our if your solution is alpha, right? If we get if we have alpha plus or minus plus or minus i beta, then you just substitute alpha into here and beta, and then you have your solution. So let's look at an example of this. So let's suppose that we want to solve for x squared times y double prime plus 17y equals to zero. Okay, so again, we go back to this form. We can use this is second order. Um, like an order linear differential equation homogeneous. Okay, so this is going to be m, right? So for this form, remember that we have m equals to, sorry, we have a m squared plus b minus a times m plus c. Okay, so a is going to be four and um, C is 17. B here will be zero. So there's no Y prime term. Okay, so we end up getting four. Right? So we have four M squared plus, and B is zero here. So we have minus four M plus 17. Okay, so solving this um, using the, we can use the quadratic formula. Okay, so we have minus, uh, so we have negative B, A plus or minus B squared, minus four times four times 17. Divided by two times four. Okay, so simplify all this, end up getting, let's see, um, four plus or minus um, square root of minus 16 divided by eight. So this is just going, this is going to give us four plus or minus four i over eight, which is one half is equal to one half plus or minus one half pi. Okay. Um, 60, oh, sorry, this is, sorry, this is, hold on. 
Uh, that's 16 pines, sorry. Let me just check what the, so let me just check the value on this. So that should be, just double check my here. Yep, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so there should be 256. Okay, good. And uh, that's negative. All right. So therefore, right, that becomes uh, well, the i is just coming from the square root of negative one, and then we have two, and then the square root of 256 is um, 16. Okay. All right. Okay, so alpha, right? So alpha is going to be one half, and beta right, is going to be beta is going to be two. Okay. Okay, so now. Now to do, all we need to do is substitute those into our, into our general solution. Okay, so we're gonna have X to alpha plus one half times, let's see. C1, so cosine, what was beta? Beta was two. Sorry, two times um, two times natural log x plus c two times sine of two natural log x. Okay. All right. There's our there's our solution. Our general solution. So again, if, so this was for right, second order um, or second order differential equation. If you have something higher order, then you'll need to basically go through the whole process again, right? Rederive your character's equation and then, um, and then apply this, uh, this idea, okay? Okay. So what I want to do now is I want to you can go to another example. Okay. And in this example, we're going to be using um, we'll be using the new idea today, and then um, and then we and that's um, to solve for the non-homogeneous part. We have to use a variation of parameters. So it's kind of come a little bit of basically combining uh, the finding these. Okay, so let's see, let's do that over here. Okay, so let's say we wanna solve this. Okay, so we have a non-homogeneous differential equation here. And notice that the, um, the homogeneous part right, is um, basically we have a Cauchy order equation involved here. So this matches, right? The order here matches the degree here, right? So one, one, and then we have zero, zero, okay? Or just the three Y there, okay? So we don't have a differential term. Um, all right, so that's what we're dealing with. Okay, so 
Um, you can just think of this, right? This is just three X to the zero, right? And then there's zero order differential, okay? All right, so let's, so first, the, right, the obvious thing that we need to do here is solve for the homogeneous part, okay? All right. Well, sometimes, again, sometimes they, they call this the complementary solution, okay? All right, so this is second order. So we can go ahead and um, use right, use this okay, where we where we know that a that a is one. Right? This is b b is minus three and c is three. Okay, so we're gonna get, um, let's see, M squared. Okay. Thus, we get um, minus, minus three, or minus one times M plus three. Okay, so that's what we need to work with. This is factorable, right? This is going to give us basically we get m minus one times m minus three. We get m equals one and then m equals three. So, based on case one, that's going to be y equals two. Our general, our general solution for the homogeneous part is going to be y, y of h equals to c1 times x to the first power plus c2 times x to the third power. All right, so there's the homogeneous part, okay? Using, um, using this formula from what we derived today. All right, so the next part, let's, uh, we can go ahead and use, I mean, we could, we could use the trial function idea here, uh, but let's just use variation of parameters, okay? That's, that was the um, previous discussion that we, that we did. So using variation of parameters. Okay. So remember to use that, we have to normalize our differential equation. We okay. have to write this in standard form. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, so dividing, all right, we're gonna divide everything by x squared. Okay, so we have three X over X squared. So that's gonna be three over X times Y prime plus three over X squared times Y. And then we have two uh, X squared times E to the X. Okay, so 
Remember, variation of parameters, okay? And this utilizes our solution for the homogeneous case, for the homogeneous, um, this homogeneous case, right? So I'm gonna, we're gonna let y1 be equals to x, right? Okay, and I'll let y2 be equal to x cubed. And it doesn't matter. We can let y2 be x and y1, uh, y1 be x cubed. It doesn't matter here. So if you so if you if you take the if you basically figure out, right, um, we need to figure out the Roski on this. So if you switch these around, the Roski will be a negative value. So it really doesn't affect the uh, doesn't affect the general solution. Okay, so the so we need to find right. Remember that we need to find the Ronsky of these two functions. Okay, so we're gonna have derivative of x is just one. The derivative of x cubed is three x squared. So we're gonna get x times three x squared this gives us three x cubed minus x cubed. And that's going to give us two x cubed. Okay. All right. Um, and these are, this basically shows us that these are nearly independent as long as x is not equal to zero. Okay. okay so now, um, remember that we need to figure out this. This component, okay. Um, in fact, let me write up. Let me go over here and write up the variation of parameters formula, okay. Okay, so that's the component, right? This is the component that we're trying to figure out. Um, we've already got the Ron scan, okay? Um, so going over here, and we have the integral of y2, so it's x cubed, and remember f of x, f of x is just this component. All right, so we have x cubed times 2x squared times e to the x, all divided by 2x cubed, because the Ron's can. Okay, um, so this becomes, uh, we have, so we're gonna have two times x to the fifth over x cubed, that leaves us with two times uh, x to the second power, e to the x. And, oh, yeah, two cats well. Okay, so, no. all right, so that leaves us with the integral x squared times e to the x. All right, so, right, we have a product of a polynomial and, um, and the exponential function. So we need to use the product rule for integration, okay? Um, AKA the integration by parts, right? By the way, the product rule for integration is just, it can be derived from the product rule of uh, for derivatives. So it's better. So the, this is kind of, I discussed this more in my computing class, but the, but we used to call it the product rule for integration. I'm not sure when the term, when the technical term of integration by parts came out. Um, 
Because when I was in school, we used to call it that. We used to say product role for integration. All right, so I'm not sure. Yeah, so which is actually a better, in my opinion, it's better. It's a better name for it okay, than compared to integration by parts. So, but in any case, that's what we need to use here. Um, so let's do that. Let's do that over here. Let's utilize the space here. Um, and since, um, remember, so the idea is um, right, we need to choose an appropriate U and DV, right? And then basically break it down further, okay? So let's, yeah, let's do that over here. Okay, so probably you remember this. Um, it. So this is logarithms, inverse functions, algebraic functions, trigonometric functions, and exponents. Ex sorry, exponent, exponential functions. Okay. Um, so the order in which this appears, right, when you're going this way, whichever comes first, uh, that's what u is going to be. Right? given what you have here. So we have an algebraic function, right? And we have an exponential function. So u, we want u to be x squared, okay? Okay, so in fact, um, you probably also remember there's a, um, there's a um, kind of an organized way to do this using what's called tabular integration. Now tabular integration is just, is basically, it is the, uh, product rule for integration, but it's structured a little bit more differently. Um, I, I believe that that you know that kind of visualization, I believe, was um, it was there's a paper, there was a technical paper uh, released, I think, in the late 1800s. Um, so it's a very old, so there's a very old idea. Okay, um, so I'm going to apply that here. Actually, again, it's still it's still a product rule for integration, but it's it's a more kind of a, a more organized way of using it and um, it's actually tailor made. It's actually tailor made for when u is a polynomial, okay? Because the idea is that you're going to take successive derivatives of u until you reach zero. Okay? So that's tailor made for this. All right, so let's do that here. So we have so basically you have a column for the signs, and then you have the successive derivatives here, okay? And then you have successive the successive uh, antiderivatives. So I call that I for integration. So we start with plus. Okay, uh, for the first row, for the first row we put in the uh, given information. So we know that u is x squared based on this, and we have e to the x. Okay, so we continue to take successive derivatives until we reach zero. So, like I said, this is a very old idea. There was a paper, I think this was introduced in a paper in like the late 1800s. Okay, so now, um, so this, a scheme works like this, okay? So you have, right, you multiply along these lines, okay? And so the result here, so we're gonna get X, or x squared times e to the x, right? Minus 2x times e to the x, right? plus 2 times e to the x. Okay. Right, so there's a there's result. Okay. So just copying that over here. All right. So now let's figure out the next component, right? This component, right? So we have, okay, so, so we figured out, right, we have this, we already figured out this part here. And then we need to figure out this component. And I've omitted, this is just wrong scale, okay? So we know that we have the wrong, we have, this is just the wrong scale, y1 and y2. Okay, so um, y1 was x, 
times yeah, 2x squared times e to the x, all divided by a Ron's cube, uh, which was 2x cubed. Okay, and simplifying that, that's going to give us, so 2x cubes cancel out. That's basically leaving us with the integral of e to the x. Which is just e to the x, okay? Again, you don't need to, when we get to this part, you don't need to add on the c because it's, um, it can be shown that get, that gets absorbed somewhere else. Okay. Um, all right, so this part we calculated. All right. Now we just put basically um, just assemble everything together. All right, so let's see, let's keep this here. I'm going to erase this part. All right, so why of so we have y of p. y of p is going to be, right, so we have minus y1, so minus x times this part. And then plus y2 plus x cubed times e to the x. I don't need a parentheses there. See. And let's see here. We can actually simplify this a little bit. So X cubed. The, sorry, the x cubed the e to the x term will cancel out, and that leaves us with, um, it's going to leave us with 2e to the x. Um, let's see, did I distribute that? Oh, sorry, so this is 2x. All right, okay, so I have to, just, I forgot to distribute x there, so it's there now. So that's basically going to leave us with, um, let's see, and this becomes positive. So that's going to leave us with, just to confirm here, yeah, 2x squared times e to the x minus 2x times e to the x. So this term and this term is zero. So that leaves us with this. And so now remember that the general solution right, is y of h plus y of p. So we have c1 times x plus c2 times x cubed. Okay, so this part plus a particular solution. And we've got it. So that is the uh, that is our general solution. Okay. All right. So again, we start off by recognizing that this was an Euler or Cauchy Euler equation. Uh, we've solved for the basis solutions, right? The solutions for the homogeneous part. And then we use those, right? We use those two solutions and apply those to the variation of parameters formula. Uh, and then we ended up getting our particular solution. And then, so the general solution is just the homogeneous part. Um, sometimes, they, like I said, sometimes they call that the complementary solution and then add it to the particular solution. And, and that's, um, that, was, that was basically what we wanted, okay? All right, so I'm going to stop here, okay, um, and uh, make sure, you know, you continue practicing on these. Um, practice makes perfect, right? 
um, the more the more you do these, the better off you'll be prepared for um, for the uh, for the exam. Okay. Um, so I'll see you all next time.